Welcome to the broadcast of the Bethel United Reformed Church. You can visit us online at jenisonbethel.org, or you can join us each Sunday on the corner of 20th and Baldwin in Jenison. Our service times are 9.30 a.m. and 5.20 p.m. On this week's broadcast, we continue in our Advent series by looking at Isaiah 9 in a message entitled, The Prophet. If you'd like a copy of this message, you can download it and many more by going to sermonaudio.com and searching for Bethel Jenison, or you can rewatch this service by visiting the YouTube link on our website. As we turn our attention to the worship of God, may the Lord richly bless you, that you might know the comfort and the peace of belonging to the Lord. These uh, setbacks and uh, in light of this new treatment, that the Lord would uh, indeed bless her and sustain her with his hand of loving care. And uh, second of all, uh, to announce to you that uh, John Venema, who is one of our shut-ins, passed away early this morning, and uh, arrangements have not yet been set. Uh, As soon as we know anything about the arrangements, we'll be sure to uh, let you know about them. But just to inform you that John Venema did begin this day of worship in the presence of his almighty God. He began this day in the light of the glory of the God who loved him. And so we want to uh, remember this family in this time of grief and loss. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 100, the first opening words of Psalm 100. And they're very important for us as we begin this day. Because the Lord doesn't simply want us here. Uh, He wants us here with a particular perspective. He wants us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and to come into his courts with praise. We're not here to forget about life for a while, but rather we're to come here and have life put into perspective for us. That everything that we bring into this worship service and everything that's going on in our minds and everything else about the week to come or the week past, that it's put in the context of the thanksgiving and the praise that God is worthy of. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. So maybe you're not exactly coming this morning into the house of praise with thanksgiving. So maybe we need to spend a few minutes then and to prepare our hearts so that in fact we're not just here, but we're here with gratitude in light of the compassionate mercy of the Lord our God. So let's prepare our hearts in a time of silent prayer. Please rise. Congregation, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turn with me in your Psalter hymnals to Psalter number 280. Psalter number 280. O oh, bless our God with one accord, ye faithful servants of the Lord. We sing the three stanzas of 280.
Hear now the word of the Lord our God. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, And keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter. Nor your male servant, nor your female servant nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. We hear these uh, words of assurance of pardon and In point of truth, they're actually the pathway to our assurance of pardon. As the psalmist speaks, Psalm 32, the fifth verse, I acknowledge my sin to you. That's how we come to a place of assurance. We come to this place of assurance, first of all, by a place of confession. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. And that is quite a statement. Because we so often, that's what we do. That's what we're great at. We're good We're good at spinning things and putting masks on that which would make us look bad. My iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The Lord says be honest and then come to see the cure for sin. That cure for sin is what he has provided for us and that we celebrate today. The gift of light the light of the world, the light of the gospel, Jesus Christ. May you know him, love him, and live from this assurance of pardon as we go into a new week. May God be praised. Amen. Angels, we have heard on high. That's the song that we want to turn to. It's in your Bethel Sings. Bethel Sings. Hymn number 100. And we want to rise to sing the three stanzas.
Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8. I want to begin reading at verse 19, and then we'll read down to the end of verse 7 of chapter 9. If it's been a while since you've been with us, or perhaps even this is the first time that you have been with us, we are making our way through the Law and the Prophets. So two sermons on the Law, two sermons on Moses. We did that from the book of Exodus, the book of Deuteronomy, and now we shift for two sermons from the Prophets. This week from Isaiah chapter 8, and we're going to particularly be focusing on the ninth chapter, the first seven verses. We want to begin our reading with some background uh, in light of what we read here in verse 19. So when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. And it shall happen when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be driven into darkness. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. As when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them, upon them, a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as a man rejoices when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and the garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thus far. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, to the law and to the testimony, to this we come, because in this we find your will, and in this we hear your voice. Bless us now, and show to us the glory of your Son. We plead, O God, that you would cause us to bask in the light of his glory. It's for his sake that we pray. Amen. Last week, I hope you'll remember that uh, we looked at Deuteronomy 18. And now as we come to our passage this morning, we find that Isaiah in the 8th chapter, that's why I read beginning in the 8th chapter, and not just the, uh, firstly uh, from, from chapter 9, but, but in the 8th chapter because Isaiah alludes, doesn't he? He alludes to Deuteronomy 18. Look at what we read here. If you have your Bibles open still, he says this, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, 
What did Deuteronomy 18 say? You're going to come into the land, and in this land you're going to have people that say that you secure your future and you will be blessed in your future when you seek out these kinds of people, soothsayers, fortune tellers, wizards, mediums as they try to give you omens and and try to secure your future so that you can feel comfort in your future by going to them. And God says through Isaiah, should not a people seek their God? You are holy. You are beloved by God. Why in the world would you conform yourselves to this life? to this world, when you have the greatest treasure in all this world, that God calls you His people and says to you, seek my face. And I said, O Lord, your face I will seek. And so, Isaiah says, not to the mediums and to the wizards, to the law and to the testimony. It's a battle cry. It's as though you you see the enemy coming. What do you need to do? Go man the guns. Arm yourselves with the weapons. Inhabit the towers. Stand on the bulwarks. Prepare for battle. To the law. To the testimony. To the death. We will defend ourselves. Not with mediums and wizards, but with the law, with the testimony, with the voice of Almighty God. Deuteronomy 18, the prophet says, listen to the voice of the prophet. Listen to the one that God Himself will provide. And yet, what did we say last week? We said that that was not always Israel's history. More often than not, that wasn't her history. She had a top-down problem, as a matter of fact. It wasn't always the problem with the people It was the problem with the leadership. That's oftentimes what we see. Not that the men were afraid to lead. Because men always lead. Men in your families, men in your life, men in your work, you are always leading. And people are always following your example. The question is, where are you leading? How are you directing? The people cry out for a leader, Saul. It's not as though Saul wasn't leading. That wasn't the problem. Of course he was leading. But what did he do? He went to the witch of Endor and said, Give me comfort. Tell me my future. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1. So the first king says that the king of the people's choosing says, I'm going to seek my comfort by being conformed to this world. Second Kings begins by telling us about another king. And we can't even get past verse 1. And what do we read? Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. Now Azahiah fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. Give me comfort, right? The kings, top down, leading. Where were they leading? To the comforts of this life to the philosophies and the ideas of this world. These kings are not sufficient. These kings will always fail. And thus God says in the law and the testimony to which we run, I have provided my king and my king will come. 
And it comes because these kings were leading into darkness. And that's how Isaiah 8 ends. It ends with everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. It ends with the gloom of anguish and they will be driven into darkness. You want this world? You can have this world. Careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And so you're driven into darkness as you cry out, curse the king, curse God. Isaiah 9, verse 1. First word, nevertheless. That's the gospel. That's the preaching text of this passage. Nevertheless. I don't often read Matthew Henry. I read Matthew Henry's commentary this week on this passage. I love what he said. Pass it on to you. To, to you. He says, note, in the worst of times, God's people have a nevertheless to comfort themselves, something to allay and balance their troubles. God's people have a nevertheless to comfort us. That our comfort is not in the God of Ekron or in the witch of Endor. It's the God who says in the face of our sin and rank rebellion. Nevertheless, we are a people who by nature look for roses among rocks. What are you looking for? I'm looking for something beautiful among something that's foul. I'm looking for something that lives amidst something that's dead. In the midst of all of our bumbling, in all of our fumbling, in all of our bruising of ourselves, all the self-inflicted wounds, God comes to us and says, be still, be still. Because despite the gloom and the doom that you have earned for yourself, I come and give comfort, peace, light, and life. Then my prayer that as we come to this passage that you would be dumbfounded by the utter compassion of the Lord. Because here are a people that said we don't like the light. They turned off the light and they do spiritually what happens to us physically when we turn off the lights and we try and navigate ourselves back to the bed. We go, well, we can master this. We know where the bed is. We know where the table is. It's been in the same spot for the last 15 years. I should be able to navigate this by now. You turn off the lights and you're still hitting yourselves and you're still stubbing your toe and you still have bruises on your thighs because you bumped into the footboard, right? We're not as brilliant as we think that we are. We can navigate in the darkness and here we are looking like fools. And God says to us, I'm going to have mercy upon you in the midst of all your foolishness. And I'm going to give you light. The key word that Henry focused on is that word comfort. And as we come to this passage, I want you to see three comforts. The comfort of brilliant light. The comfort of an intense joy. And the comfort of kingly security. I think that's fair to say the, the three things that we see in this, in this passage. That we have given to us the comfort of, an, of a brilliant light, an intense joy, and kingly security. Let's do the hard work of digging in. Because it's only when you do the hard work of digging in that God gives you the fruit of your labor. May the fruit of your labor this morning be the sight of the King of Kings. All right, so verse 9, or rather verse uh, 1 of chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Notice, notice it's not just a nevertheless. It's not just this, this willy-nilly nevertheless, free, easy nevertheless. The gloom will not be upon her who is what? What does the text say? Who is distressed. This comfort is not for everybody. This is not cheap grace. This is costly love. And it comes upon those 
who are broken, broken to the core, that look around and, and, and don't look at the gloom of the anguish and, and being driven into darkness as something that they enjoy. I don't enjoy this. I, I don't find pleasure in this. I hate this. I despise this. I am distressed with this. I see this as my end. I am broken. The Lord says that nevertheless comes to those who are the least. Not those that say, well, I can navigate the darkness, no problem. But those that know that they are undone as they live in the darkness. So it's interesting then that the Lord refers to the tribes and the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali because these were the least of the least. Zebulon was second from the last tribe to have land allotted to it in the division of the land under Joshua. Zebulon was the fifth from the last tribe to have land allotted to it. And they didn't necessarily get the best land. Go figure. They were one of the last ones. So they were stuck with what was ever left over. They were in the northern, in the northern region of Israel. And so they were the furthest away from the place that represented closeness to God, Jerusalem. Well, they were the furthest away from that place of closeness to God. They were the least. As a matter of fact, I'm almost positive we talked about this before, but if you were from the north, you were considered a bumpkin. You were considered a, a less sophisticated person than if you were from the south. But what does the prophet Isaiah say? He says this, A brilliant light has come to the least of the least. To those who are at the greatest distance, to the greatest closeness that you can have, the greatest nearness that you can have, a light has come to the least of the least in Galilee of the Gentiles. In other words, a light will come to the most unlikely of people. A people who are fumbling around and, and groping in the darkness to find their way who cannot find their way. A light has come. Turn with me in your Bibles to, to Psalm 112 if you're following along. Maybe you're not, but, but Psalm 112. I, I think this is, this is helpful for us in what we see in, in this passage. And so catch up as, as you find your way there. Psalm 112 begins with praise the Lord, a, a call to give God his due. But then it goes on to say this, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandment. Blessed is the least of the least. Happiness belongs to the man who looks around at the gloom and the doom of the world around him and says, I, I don't delight in any of this, but my delight, my delight is in the law of the Lord and on that law I meditate day and night because I do not want to sit in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 112 echoes Psalm 1. But it also speaks of what we read here in Isaiah 9. That the nevertheless comes to a people who are broken and who are the least, who delight greatly in the law, in the testimony. Verse 4, what does it say? Unto the upright there arises what? Light in the darkness. God is gracious and full of compassion and righteousness. Light, right? The Lord will give light to those in darkness. And, and why does the psalmist focus on this? Why, why, why does the Lord in Isaiah 9 focus on this? Because it's all about comfort. Today's a perfect illustration of this. This season of the year is a perfect illustration of this. We say to each other after the service, man, kind of a gloomy day out there today. I hope we have some sun again. I hope, hope, you know, the other day was the last time we ever see the sun. And then what happens February, March, usually for us living in Michigan, April, we say, we need the sun. Why? Because physically, psychologically, physiologically, what do our bodies, what do our bodies need? They need light. 
Think about that. God made us physically to need light. Emotionally, we need light. Physically, we need light. He did not create us to live years on end in darkness. And we feel the pinch of that on gloomy days, kind of depressing days. Really? Why is it a depressing day? Because God created me to need light. Isaiah says that the light has shined. Comfort has come. What our bodies recognize beyond question, I need light. That's why some people escape to go to Florida. <laughs> what our bodies recognize, do our souls recognize? Zechariah 14, verse 6 and, six and 7, it shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be on the day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time, it shall happen that it will be light. The prophet says there is coming a day when the darkness is at its darkest, that the light will come. And those that need the light the most, who crave for the light, will have light. Isaiah says, to you who are the least, light shall come. And how has it come? It has come through Jesus Christ. But let's go a little bit further than that. Or not further, I suppose. It's the wrong way of putting it. There's not someone more than Jesus Christ, but let's go deeper than that because I really want you to see the beauty of how this all comes together. John chapter 1, verse 43. John 1, verse 43. The following day, Jesus went to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to Philip, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of where? Nazareth. You see, Nathanael didn't know his Bible. Oftentimes we like to say, no, these people knew their Bibles. They knew them forward. They knew them backwards. Finally, we find a guy who didn't know his Bible. Nathaniel says, nothing good can come out of Nazareth. Oh, buddy, I, you need to study your Bible a little bit more. Because do you know where Nazareth was? Nazareth was in the land of of Zebulun. Zebulun is where Nazareth was. He's saying, can anything good come out of Zebulun? Well, of course something good can come out of Zebulun because Isaiah 9 says, the light of the world is going to come out of Zebulun. You know where Jesus' public ministry began? It began in Capernaum. Listen to what we read, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed to Galilee. So this is all simultaneous to what we read in John 1. He's departing to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, leaving Zebulun, the land of Zebulun, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, quote, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. Whoa. Particularly, Capernaum was in the region of Naphtali. Matthew, why are you recording this for us? We read verse 14, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Galileans, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, 
light has dawned. Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Where did the light of the world dawn? In the place of the least of the least. In the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, that's where Jesus begins his ministry in fulfillment of Isaiah 9. And now, brothers and sisters, can you not see Paul at this point, Acts 28, showing these Jews on their map, because he's been talking about Deuteronomy 18, let's say, and he says, now, that brings me to Isaiah 8, because Isaiah 8 Talks about Deuteronomy 18. Now on a map, let me show you something. Do you know where Jesus was raised? He was raised in a town called Nazareth. And they go, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Funny, I heard Nathaniel say that one time. But you know your Bibles. You, you guys know your Bibles. And you know where Nazareth is. It is in Zebulun. And do you know where his ministry began? in Capernaum, in the land of Naphtali, so that the light of the nations might shine from where? The place of the least of the least. The man who was raised in the region of the least of the least, right? Because this is where he was raised, in Nazareth, in Zebulon. The man who was raised in the place of the least shines upon the least so that we might have comfort That we might have what our bodies recognize we need. We need light. He shines so that our souls might have light. That our souls might be comforted. And how are they comforted? Because when light shines, it shows darkness for what it is. Children, maybe some of you are scared of the dark. Let me tell you, there's nothing to be afraid of. Darkness is powerless. Darkness has no power, none whatsoever. Because when light decides that it's going to shine, it shines. And darkness can't say, nope, not today, you're not going to shine light. I will not submit every single time that light says, I'm going to shine, darkness has to submit because it's powerless to resist. God the Father sent the Son in the midst of the powerlessness of the darkness, to shine so that we as children, scared of the dark, might know the power of the light, comfort. And from that comfort, the brilliance of that comforting light comes what? An intense joy. And that's what we see in the second place, an intense joy. Verse 3. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. God opens the eyes with light and fills the heart with joy. One of the sure indications that you're a believer is not that you're grumpy. I think sometimes we think that's a sure indication that you're alive and that you're a conservative Christian. You're grumpy and you're negative. Well, that's a conservative Christian. No, no. A sure sign that we are believers in the law and the testimony is that we have joy. Hopefully, God willing, we're going to look at that a little bit more this evening from Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. The second thing off Paul's pen is the word joy, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. The surest indication that we are a believer is when we have every reason to be negative and grumpy. We bless the Lord at all times and His praise is continually on our lips because His love is in our hearts. We saw that last week, Ninth Commandment, the connection between the mouth and the heart. You say what's in the heart. We express what's in the heart. Joy. And Isaiah says, joy will be yours. Joy will be increased to you. What's joy? How do you define joy? How do you describe it? What does that that mean? 
I think as we look at our text here, Isaiah gives to us three ways of, of, of trying to get our minds around what he's saying in terms of the joy that we have and we experience as the light shines. What's the joy that we're talking about? First, he says, it, it's like the joy of harvest time. And, and we know that, right? Maybe that sounds familiar. Harvest time joy. Well, we don't have harvest time joy. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, yeah, of course you do. We're talking about Thanksgiving. We still to this day say that one of our great experiences of joy as a family when the kids and the grandkids come over and we, we sit them all around the table and Grandpa puts a little Johnny on his lap and we read the Bible together and we make a toast together and we eat this wonderful food together, and we say, God is good. What a joy. And Isaiah says, that's the kind of intense joy that I'm talking about that's been given to you as the, as the light shines upon you. It's the kind of joy that you have when you get together and you celebrate the harvest and, and how good God is to you. That's what I'm talking about. Because if, if you're missing the whole, I don't understand joy, well, you understand that, don't you? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Second, he says what? He says it's the kind of joy of liberation from bondage. Like, okay, we're going to maybe have to scratch on that one or, or punt on this one because I, I don't know that we're going to understand this. Verse 4, it's the kind of joy that you have when you've been set free. I think we can understand that. I was just talking before, before the worship service that their brother just got his college tuition paid off. And we're talking about what a great thing that is. And I think one of you too posted recently on Facebook, paid off. And it, and it made a Facebook post. Well, a lot of things make Facebook, I understand. But, but that was a particularly <laughs> joyous one, right? Free of that burden. Rumor has it there are some of you that don't even pay a mortgage. You paid your mortgage off. Can't even imagine that. That there's a certain bondage to the debtor. And then when you're done paying off the mortgage, what do you do? You celebrate. I'm free of that. It's over. It's so liberating. It's so refreshing. I don't have that burden anymore. You're free. See, you understand this. You get this. And that's what he's saying. It's a rare joy. It's an intense joy. It's a rare joy. It's a liberating, freeing, peaceful joy. Third, it's the joy of victory. Verse 5, it's the kind of joy that you have when war is over, when you take those, those boots that, that are all muddy from war and conflict, and, and even more so, you take up the garments that are, that are all bloody from the conflict, and you roll them up, and they're burned, and it's no more, no more war. It's the kind of take it to the streets joy. We're going to celebrate. There's something to rejoice. No more war. We long for that. No more war. Another year we've got to go, Lord, be with the brothers in Afghanistan. No more conflict. We're still feeling it. Another news story. 26 people dead. 26-year-olds dead. You long for it to be over. On this side, it's never going to be over. But God says, I give you the joy of victory. And that comfort is yours. This rare joy, this intense joy, and this victorious joy, a secession of war. It's all done. I give you peace. How do you have that? Well, you see, you have that when you don't root your comfort in things, but you root your comfort in the king. And that's what we see in the final place. Kingly security. We have the comfort of this light. We have the comfort that comes from being able to rejoice as we see with the eye of faith what? The king who rules. For unto us a child is born, and to us his son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Our comfort comes to the one who was a child and grew to be a man, 
because this man is the king. That the one who is, was, and ever shall be remains king. That the sacrifice is shed as the priest who offers up the lamb. The sacrifice is spoken of by the one who is the prophet. And the comfort of the sacrifice is held secure by the one who is the king. Let's be honest. We would all go nuts. We would all be basket cases if it wasn't for this last point. If we do not know the kingly security of our sovereign Lord, then all there is is vanity. If all we had was the news to turn on and see more tragedy, what would keep us from the tragedy? If it was not for the fact that, that God is on the throne, and, and while I don't know all the particulars, but I know his will is good, I know he's gathering his church, I know he's building his kingdom, if it wasn't for that, we would go nuts, bonkers, with everything on a day-to-day -day basis we have to feel, see, experience, and our homes, and our work, in the news, nuts. What protects us? What keeps our sanity in the vanity? Kingly security. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and at last we have good government. That's not a political statement. That's a slam against the kings who were leading Israel. At last we have someone who will lead. What's the name of the king? And here you see the prophet grasping to see in this prophetic vision, because he can't name him. There's no, hello, my name is on this child that, that is born. He, he's grasping and he's struggling to identify who this is. And he, and he doesn't give us much more than a description of what he is. And at the end of the day, isn't that what a name is? Apparently, at some point in my life, in my history, there was a gardener in our family, and at some point they said, what are we going to call this guy, this funny-looking Dutch guy? What are we going to call him? I know, let's call him Gardener. Let's call him Mr. Gardener. Sounds good. All right. He was named after what he was, is, did, whatever. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah comes and takes the adjective wonderful and says, you want to see something wonderful? I'm going to turn it into a proper name. That the one whose name is above all names, his name is wonderful. The one who is wonderful is named wonderful. He is counselor. He is mighty God. He's everlasting father. He is prince of peace, not prince of Wales, not duke of York, prince of peace. All the words that Isaiah uses here to name the one whose name is above all names, all the words that, that he uses here speaks of totality and completeness. The word wonderful finds its meaning in the one who, whose name is wonderful. He is mighty, almighty God, everlasting Father, not limited, but total peace. He's the Prince of Peace, not the Prince of this Hamlet, but Prince of Peace. He rules over peace. And because of this, because his name speaks of his limitlessness, there is no limit, no end to the increase of his government and his peace. Isaiah says, upon the throne of David, and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. There is no limit. And the whole point is comfort. Comfort because the one whose name is above all names rules over us as David's greater son. You know why that's comfort? Because God says, I am not slow in keeping my promises. I have not forgotten I keep my word. It's as if Isaiah is saying, why go to the wizards and the mediums when you have the king? 
You see, that's the point. In order to know this comfort, you must die to all the other comforts. To live in the joy of the light, you must leave the darkness in order to rejoice in the name that is above all names. You must find your name in His. And that's the message that Paul brought in Acts 28, whether he came to Isaiah 9 or not, because that's the message of the Gospel. Nevertheless, here's what God announces to the least. The one who is least among men has come. And in His lowliness, we see His greatness. That the greater serves the lesser. And now we, the lessers, have hope because we have joy, because we have light, because we have the King. Let's pray. Beloved Father in heaven, receive our gratitude and our praise for the one who is the King, the one who leads victoriously and has given us his victory earned for us on the cross, his cross, so that we might now go into this world and bear the cross as we live, not with the negativity of hopelessness, but with the joy of believing that you are on the throne. We thank you, Lord, that you protect our hearts and our minds from the anxieties that plague our souls. That you protect us, O Lord, from the gloom of darkness, and we see gloom. We live in the valley of the shadow of death, and we hear daily the reports of death and decay. It's in all around that we see. And thus, O Lord, of all people, you have come unto us, the least of the least. You have come as the greater to the lesser, that we might seek your face. God, if we do not know this comfort, if we have not yet confessed you as our peace, if we have not yet confessed you as our Lord and our God, our King triumphant, in this day, O oh Lord, may we know peace. May we lay down our weapons of warfare and destruction. And Lord, may we know you as our Abba. And Lord, as we know you as our Abba, may we go into this week with a comfort unimaginable, almost unexplainable, and yet a comfort, O oh Lord, that we have the privilege to announce to all the nations, the King has come. Bow. And so, Lord, even now as we bow, we acknowledge your sovereign rule and reign and pray that you will lead us and guide us for Christ's sake. Amen. Turn with me in your Bethel Sings once again, this time to hymn number 112. Number 112, what child is this? Who is this child that's been born to us? Who is this one that, that has come in the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah? He is the king. So let's rise to sing to his praise all the stanzas of 112.
Go now in the blessing of the Lord our God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. joining us for another broadcast from the Bethel United Reformed Church. It's our privilege to bring these services to you each week as we seek to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about us here at Bethel, we'd love to hear from you and introduce ourselves to you. You can join us for Sunday worship at 9.30 a.m. or 5.20 p.m. Or you can read more about us on our website at jenisonbethel.org. We trust that the Lord has fed you with his word in this day. May you now, therefore, go in his peace until he brings us together again.